It's an extraordinary claim that a lost tribe of Jews missing for thousands of years has been found at the extreme end of the African continent. The man who makes this claim is Tudor Parfit. Can you imagine your name as an explorer would go down in history? Many see him as a real life Indiana Jones. I realized that if I stopped, I was dead. A man prepared to risk his life in the pursuit of the truth. I put my head down and drove straight through the barrier. If he's right, he may have also found the most mythical wonder in the Bible, the Ark of the Covenant. I believe that is uh, the Lemba Ark of the uh, Covenant. Could it possibly be true? Has Tudor Parfit made one of the greatest discoveries of all time? Jerusalem, 1963. Tudor Parfit is a 19-year-old student. He's spending a year interning in the city, working with the families of disabled children. He meets Jews from Europe, but also from Asia. and the experience affects him deeply. There were new immigrants from places like Kurdistan or Afghanistan. At the end of the year, I'd visited 52 families, and each one had a completely different history. And uh, I think from that point, I was, I was hooked. What hooked Parfit was an extraordinary idea. After thousands of years in exile, wave after wave of Jews were returning to the Holy Land. The Bible had prophesied that one day, the Jewish diaspora would be reunited, that the lost tribes of Israel would return. Immediately, the, the idea of the in-gathering of the exiles was, was apparent to me. That's what Israel was in the 50s and 60s. People came from all over the world. It made Parfit wonder. Were there any more lost tribes out there still living in exile? The story of the lost tribes of Israel begins in one of the darkest moments in the history of Judaism. Between the 8th and 6th centuries BC, Israelite tribal land was invaded by the Assyrian and Babylonian empires. They really enjoyed the literal decapitations of these heads of state. They would chop hands, feet, testicles off, chop heads off. Um, if, uh, if two neighboring kingdoms were in coalition with one another, um, there's a very well-known story of one king being decapitated and his partner king having to wear his severed head around his own neck. Worse was yet to come. 
the holy city of Zion, Jerusalem, was attacked. There was a long siege. Some scholars think it was as long as a year and a half, perhaps a little longer. And eventually, the Babylonians broke through and burnt the city down, destroyed the temple, and uh, took the people off into exile. They carted off a great act of ethnic cleansing, the important people, the nobles and the doctors and the lawyers. Eventually, after some 50 years in exile, the Jews are released. Some make their way back to the Holy Land, but many do not. These are the lost tribes, and no one is sure what became of them. The Bible says some may have stayed in Babylon, but doesn't tell us where the rest went. Over the years, there have been promising clues People following Jewish rituals have been found in northern India, others in Afghanistan, and more in Ethiopia. Parfit is especially intrigued by something wrapped in this story. The great treasure of the Jews, the Ark of the Covenant, the holiest object in the Holy Land said to contain the Ten Commandments also disappears at the time of the diaspora. Did some of the exiles take it with them? If so, what became of it? Was it destroyed? Or could it still be with one of the lost tribes? South Africa. Parfit is invited to Johannesburg. Jews from all over the world want to hear him talk. The hall was full of white South Africans, very prosperous looking individuals, uh, mainly from the Jewish community. But in the course of the lecture, Tudor notices a group of black men. Right at the back of the hall, there were some really shabbily dressed black people. No shoes, really looked scruffy and out of place. At the end of the lecture, the men approach Parfit. They're from a southern African tribe called the Lemba. They claim to be a lost tribe of Israel. They have spent years campaigning for recognition, but no one will believe them. Can he help them? At first, Parfit is skeptical. Nobody wanted to believe that Alemba Aju. But they, they saw that uh, they are respecting Shabbat, they are, they are respecting the law of uh, slaughtering, they are, uh, the purity of the family, they, they got it. But nobody in this time believed them. He was among the more skeptical as to the Middle East, Near East, or Semitic origins of the Lemba people and approached this question, I think, as a good scholar should, as a hypothesis that could be refuted or uh, should be tested. Despite his doubts, Parfit agrees to make further inquiries. The men give Parfit the name of a Lemba academic who can provide more information. He travels north of Johannesburg to the town of Louis Trickhart. 
to meet Professor Mishaya Mativa. I became friendly with Professor Mativa, who was a professor at one of the black universities in South Africa. And he told me all the legends of the Lemba, and he was the historian of the, of the tribe. The Prof. Mativa is the leader of Lemba. He studied many, many uh, history about the people and is uh, like a reference. I am Lemba. Yeah? Okay. My father. Mativa reveals some surprising facts. The Lemba only eat kosher meat. and practice circumcision. He says they arrived on the east coast of Africa in the early Middle Ages and gradually migrated south and west to Zimbabwe. Tudor is still skeptical. Having similar rituals to the Jews is surprisingly widespread a lot of the, the rituals that are identified as being supposedly Jewish are actually rituals and traditions and practices that were fairly common both in the ancient and more recent past in the Middle East. The kinds of Israelite stories that you find among the Lemba you find among tribes all over Africa. They take a story from uh, some biblical source, perhaps, and introduce it into their own tribal narrative. And there's an even bigger problem. The Lemba live 5,000 miles away from Israel. Is it possible that they could have traveled that far? Summer, 1990, adventurer Tudor Parfait is on a journey in Africa. His plan, to investigate the Lemba, a southern African tribe that claimed to be a lost tribe of Israel. The Lemba homeland, Mberengwe, is in a lawless part of South Zimbabwe. It's the kind of place unwary travelers can get themselves killed. He'll have to venture into hostile territory. The police fear for Parfit's life. They arrange for Tagaruze, an armed policeman, to escort Parfit to the Lemba villages. They walk 30 miles through the arid, dusty, and bandit-ridden countryside. Finally, at dusk, Parfit and Tagaruze walk into a Lemba village. I put this handkerchief over my head to keep off the sun and I was really, really hot and sweaty and disgusting by the time I got to this place. And the women were out sitting under the eaves of the hut and they thought it was howlingly funny. And so that was the beginning of my uh, relationship with an ember. The next morning, Parfit is woken by loud noises outside his hut. Curious, he wanders out to see what's going on. The villagers are hosting a welcome feast. I went outside and, um, and they were leading um, a ram and there was a bell around the neck of the ram and a flower stuck into the animal and so on. 
And they said, well, this beautiful animal is for you. Parfit immediately goes to work looking for any signs of Jewish behavior. As the feast gets underway, he soon spots something. They put the, the ram on this rounded rock. I mean, this was extraordinarily biblical. The ram is killed in a manner that looks suspiciously familiar. They cut its throat and the blood covered the rock. The slaughter has all the hallmarks of a Jewish kosher ritual. The presentation of the, of the animal was uh, certainly seemed to be very Semitic. Some of the Lemba customs clearly appear Jewish although that could all be a coincidence. Parfit needs to unlock their secrets. To learn more, Parfit leaves Zimbabwe and heads back to Professor Mativa in Lewis Trickart. Mativa refers him to another Lemba tribesman, Wilfred Poppy. He's writing a book on his tribe. In the right mood, says Mativa, Poppy might just spill some Lemba secrets. He was utterly mad. He was a card-carrying lunatic, was Wilfred Poppy, but very, very knowledgeable. And when he wasn't screaming and shouting and walking out on me, he was full of good information. In between tirades, Poppy spills a real gem. The Lemba aren't ordinary Jews. They are from a privileged elite. A priestly caste, no less. What's more, says Poppy, they revere a holy city called Sena. In medieval Arabic, Sena means Zion. It's another clue. The Jews were exiled from the holy city of Zion, Jerusalem. Could Sena and Jerusalem be one and the same? Slowly, Poppy begins to reveal more. Critically, how the Lemba might have left Jerusalem and gone to southern Africa. And it involves another city, also called Sena. He talked a lot about how the first immigrants to come from the Middle East came in a boat and that there were seven people. And the first thing they did was to create a new city, which was called Senna. So that was the story that Poppy said. We came from Senna, we crossed in the boat, seven of us got to the east coast of Africa, and then we came inland, and in his words, we were scattered among the Gentiles. So, the Lemba are the descendants of just seven priestly Jews who had crossed over from the Middle East. They had embarked from a city called Sena, named after the holy city of Zion. It sounds plausible, though hardly proof of anything. Then, just as Parfit is about to thank him and leave, Poppy spills one more secret, and this one is truly extraordinary. He mentions a mysterious object called the Ngoma. 
He says the Lemba carried it with them from the Holy Land. It's an object which still exists today. Is a wooden box. And in two, there is uh, uh, the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments that Moses got in Sinai. They bring it from Sana, they put it in a big house, which consider like the temple, and they call Ngomalungundu. It sounds remarkably like the Ark of the Covenant. Like the Ark, the Ngoma was sacred. Only the priests could touch it. Like the Ark, the Ngoma was taken into battle where it was said to rain fire on the Lemba's enemies. They were very keen on their lost Ark of the Covenant and they were telling me about how they used to take it into battle. They'd always win and smoke would come out of it and it would kill people dead and this kind of stuff. Spring 1990 finds Parfit back in Oxford hunting for clues. This time, he turns to the Lemba's alleged journey If the priests had crossed from the Middle East into Africa, there should be a trail of evidence. In particular, where was the city of Sena they claimed to have built just before they crossed to Africa? It was frustrating that they didn't have any idea at all where Sena was. They'd point vaguely towards the north, and that really would be, uh, would be it. So, Parfit decides to narrow down his search. He focuses on the shortest crossing point between the Middle East and Africa. Yemen. Not knowing if he will find anything, Parfit travels to Yemen's main port city of Aden. In Aden, no one seems to have heard of a place called Sena. Until one day, Parfit meets a sheik. And I told him the story about the Lemba and uh, how I'd failed to find the Senna and his eyes lit up and he clapped his hands together and he said, I've got the solution to your problem because if you go right to the end of this valley system, there is indeed a place called Senna. It's a breakthrough. If this Senna is close to the sea, it could be from here that the priests sailed to Africa. Parvet wants to see for himself. He jumps in his car to get to this Sena in the Hadramat region of Yemen. And sure enough, it is connected to the sea. The town was linked to a port on the Indian Ocean, which was not very far away. So you, you get to the port, and then within a matter of a couple of weeks, you'd be right in southern Africa if you went at the right time of the year following the trade winds. And Parfit discovers something else. There is another link between the port and the Lemba. Talking to the people in Sena, I discovered that the clan names of the, um, of the Lemba were, in many cases, identical to the names of the people who lived in that part of the Yemen. For Parfit, it's the icing on the kick. The Lemba must have come from Yemen. They share customs with Jews. And 
they look up to the same holy city of Zion, or Sena. And he now knows how they traveled to Africa from Israel. The Lemba must be a lost tribe of Israel. It is the year 2000, 15 years after Tudor Parfit began his investigation into the Jewish origins of the South African Lemba tribe. He's in the city of Haifa in northern Israel. It's an institute at the forefront of genetic research. Genetics has shown that the ancestry of any group of men can be traced through the male Y chromosome. Well, it was one of those very interesting things. Um, a few people at the same time in the late 1990s realized that you inherit your Y chromosome unchanged from your father and he from his father and so on back throughout history. DNA tests are run on the Lemba. Are their Y chromosomes like those of most Southern Africans? Or closer to the Semitic peoples of the Middle East? The results are astonishing. Remarkably, approximately 50% of members of the Lemba had Y chromosomes that were much more like those that are found in Semitic populations in the Near East, for example, or in communities that hail from the Near East, different than the distribution of those markers that one might see in other African nations who were their neighbors. It's the first hard evidence that the Lemba hail from the Middle East. But the Middle East is vast, and there are many Semitic peoples in the region, not just Jews. Yes, they did come from the Middle East, but I want to know where did they come from in the Middle East? Parfit now tries to narrow the story of the Lemba's ancestry down even further. Can he trace their DNA back to Sena in Yemen? If so, then he can verify that part of their story. We were hoping to find good overlap between the population of the Hadramaut and the, and the Lemba. Again, the results show clear genetic links between the Lembas and the people of Sena. So the Lemba must have passed through there, just as they have always claimed. But the biggest question of all remains, are the Lemba actually Jewish? Could they really be a lost tribe of Israel? Back in Israel, a series of tests are underway, comparing the Lemba's DNA to Jewish DNA. Parfit recalls how the Lemba historian Wilfred Poppy had claimed that the seven Lembas who had first arrived in Africa had been from a special priestly caste. So he has their DNA compared with that of Jews whose surname is Cohen. All Cohens are said to be descended from Aaron, the brother of Moses, and all priests must be of his bloodline. If the Lembas really are from a line of priests, then they should be related to the Cohens. You can only be a priest if you inherit that status from your father, he has it from his father, and so on throughout history. 
all of those men called Cohen have the tradition that their ancestors had been priests in the Temple of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. For Parfit and the Lemba, it is the moment of truth. Are they Jewish or aren't they? The results come in. More than half of Lemba men share the exact same Cohen DNA markers. The shared Cohen markers prove that Lemba's Jewish origins are ancient. The Lemba are from a long lost tribe of priestly Jews and their ancestry stretches back to Moses himself. This changed history because what we discovered from the analysis of the data was that the priestly clan had a particular genetic element which was identical to that of Jewish priests. The DNA proves it. Almost everything the Lemba believed about themselves was true. They had been exiled from Jerusalem. They traveled through Yemen. And settled in southern Africa, just as they had always claimed. The chances of this being a coincidence are uh, none. It could not be. It's millions and millions and millions to one against. So it was an absolute proof that um, there was a strong connection between the Lemba and Israelite populations in the remote past. For the Lemba, it is a vindication of everything that they have ever believed about themselves. I think it's a great moment for them. But as I say, uh, they don't need someone else, you know, come to tell them that they are Jew. Themselves, they say, they are Jew. For Parfit, this triumph of research opens up another truly extraordinary thought. He recalls his conversation with Wilfred Poppy. If Poppy is right about the Lemba being priestly Jews, could he also be right about the Lemba carrying the Ark of the Covenant with them? And if so, what had they done with it? The mystery of the Ark of the Covenant dates back to Jerusalem at the end of the 6th century. In a city besieged by warring powers. The holiest treasure in the city is the Ark of the Covenant. Built to carry the Ten Commandments. It is guarded by the priestly elite in the legendary Temple of Solomon. The Israelites believe that if they took it into battle, they could not be beaten. When the temple is destroyed in 587 BC, the Ark simply disappears from the Bible. It is never mentioned again. No one knows what happens to the Ark. The biblical writers go really quiet when the Babylonians destroyed the temple in 587. 
It suggests either that the Ark wasn't really that important after all, or that it has been destroyed, but it's too um, dangerous politically and religiously a tradition to dwell on. Because if you say the Ark's been destroyed, then does that suggest that God's been destroyed? Investigator Tudor Parfit begins to wonder, could Wilfred Poppy have been onto something when he revealed how the Lemba had carried with them an object called the Ngoma, which he had also described as the Ark? It seemed almost inconceivable that this story, that they'd brought an object from the Middle East which did all of the things that the Ark of the Covenant did, that was carried on poles just like the Ark of the Covenant, which had sacred things inside it and was carried on the shoulders of priests who we could now say were actually descended from the priests in Jerusalem. How could there be no connection between the object that was venerated in Jerusalem 2,000 years on ago. The Ark of the Covenant is one of the greats. Wouldn't it be fantastic to find the two tablets of the Ten Commandments? Can you imagine your name as an explorer would go down in history? There's a problem, though. According to the Lemba, their Ark is not a chest, like it's described in the Bible. The Ngoma is a drum. When Parfit begins his research, he discovers something intriguing. In the Bible, the Ark is not always a chest. There is the fabled Ark that once stood in the temple, but the ark that was carried by wandering tribes and into battle is described differently. Sometimes it's an instrument. The word for ark in Hebrew could easily be associated with a verb which means to ring out or to make a sound and that might conceivably connect the ark with some sort of a musical instrument. Many scholars now believe that there was more than one ark. The permanent chest on display in the temple and more portable replaceable arks that were taken on journeys or into battle. If so, could the Ngoma be one of these? Parfit digs deeper into the text. Is there anything else in the Bible which suggests that the Ark could be the same as the Ngoma? Now, there are all kinds of little clues if you read the Bible attentively. One of which is that the thing was covered over with leather, and it's a particular kind of leather. Now, that immediately suggests some sort of a, of a drum. Convinced that the Ngoma must be one of these portable arcs, he travels back to southern Africa, the Lemba homeland, to speak to the elders. In a township near Lewis Trickart, he heads for a bar. But instead of Lemba elders, he is met by some younger locals, and they are drunk. We're sitting on both sides of this table, and they're glaring at me and saying, you know, white shouldn't be involved in these things, and this is just neo-colonialism and you should just leave us alone. And... 
bugger off. And then one of the guys challenged me to an arm wrestle. Very foolishly, but very reluctantly, I agreed, thinking it wouldn't last very long anyway. And so we're in this situation. Of course, he's a million times stronger than me. my fist down onto the table and uh, drew blood. Yes! Wrong things here, yeah, man. What did you call me? Get out of the things. Harfit backs off, hoping to avoid further trouble. And then anyway, I left. And I got into my car. Drove back towards the main road, taking a shortcut across the veld, and a couple of miles down the road, I went round this bend in the bush, and I saw this barrier had been erected across the road. It was clearly an ambush. There were men on both sides. Um, there was so much violence at the time in South Africa that I realized that if I stopped, I was dead. So I put my head down and drove straight through the barrier, the branches and trees and goodness knows what. And somehow I managed to get through. As I was doing this, I heard shots being fired into the back window of the car. Luckily, I survived. Investigator Tudor Parfit is severely shaken. His quest for the Ark of the Covenant has nearly cost him his life. He begins to wonder, perhaps someone does not want him to find this Ark or Ngoma. For the next seven years, Parfit pursues a host of leads elsewhere. But they lead nowhere. I embarked on quite a number of wild goose chases. Various other people had given me dud leads. Whether this was deliberate or not, I do not know, but I spent more time in remote caves um, in South Africa and Zimbabwe than any man alive. Parfit returned to his base in Southern Africa. He's on the verge of giving up. It was actually very depressing because my hopes had been built up. I went into this the bar and decided to drown my uh, sorrows a bit with a whiskey or two. He is at his wit's end. The Ngoma can't just have disappeared. But he has no idea where to go from here. The quest that has consumed him for decades has hit a dead end. He pours out his frustrations to a complete stranger. And then, out of nowhere, the man drops a thunderbolt into the conversation. It was all about his time in Zimbabwe, a decade earlier when the country was in a state of chaos. 
He was telling me the story about how he and his mate were taking this load of artifacts that were being taken for safekeeping during the Civil War, a very important pile of ethnographic uh, objects. Many of these priceless objects, he said, are sitting in storerooms in museums in the Zimbabwean capital of Harare. An extraordinary possibility now dawns on Parfit. Might the Ngoma be among those objects? Could the Ark be in Harare? Just a few hours drive from where he is drinking. The next morning, Parfit heads to the Harare Museum of Natural Sciences. He gets a cool reception. The curator doesn't see how there could be a priceless relic in the museum without his knowledge. I said, would you have storerooms? And they said, yes, we've got a, a storeroom. And I said, well, can I go into it and see it? And they were very reluctant, and nobody's allowed to go in there except the curator. But finally, I was able to persuade them that I was a you know, British academic, I was serious, I wasn't going to steal anything. And they let me in. I went in there, you know, my heart was beating. object on the bottom shelf and it was covered over with mouse droppings and goodness knows what and was very dusty and dirty but it was obvious that this was the real thing and the authentic uh, Nagoma Longundu. And I'm overcome with emotion. I think, my God, this is really the end of a very, very long chase. It was a kind of very dramatic moment. Was Parfit looking at an authentic, portable version of the Ark of the Covenant? Could he really have found one of the most hallowed objects in history? Parfit needs hard evidence. So in Oxford, he orders a carbon-14 test to establish the date of the wood. He waits anxiously for the result. His mission now rests in the hands of others. The Ngoma is dated to 1350 AD. 2,000 years after the original Ark. But Parfit is not disheartened. For a start, that makes it one of the oldest wooden objects ever found in Africa. Something which means it is of great historical importance. It was pretty old. It's about six, seven hundred years old, which in terms of African wooden objects is older than anything else that's ever been discovered.
but he is also sure of something else. Arcs used for traveling would have been replaced many times, especially if they were damaged in battle. This is entirely consistent with the oral tradition uh, of the Lemba, that hundreds of years ago, one arc blew up, destroyed. It was replaced at some point. They don't know exactly when. So although the Ngoma might not be the arc, it could be an arc, a replica of the original and no less holy. This is an incredible discovery. I believe that is uh, the Lemba Ark of uh, Covenant, Ngomalungundu, uh, is sure. Tudor Parfit is now recognized as one of the greatest scholars of Jewish history in modern times. His discoveries show that the most outlandish of myths can turn out to be true. Few now question that the Lemba are a lost tribe of Israel. I think a key lesson that was learned during the course of this research was that we should take uh, people's own narratives about themselves a lot more seriously and that they are indeed valid for hypothesis testing in true scientific ways, you know, with a rigorous approach. As for the Lemba, they have what they want. Today, they are recognized as Jews and are now being prepared so that one day, if they want to, they can return to Israel. Parfit wanted the Ngoma to be the star attraction of a museum. But before it can be put on display, it vanishes. There are unsubstantiated rumors that Robert Mugabe, the president of Zimbabwe, seized the Ngoma for his own personal collection. Rumors denied by Mugabe. So, despite all Parfit's efforts, the story of the Ark of the Covenant is back where it started, hidden from our view. Another mystery waiting to be solved. <laughs>